What's up guys? Welcome back to our channel. If you did not catch our very last video where we outlined all of the details, all of the details of when we were robbed here in Costa Rica, you might want to go check that one out first before you come here because it will make a lot of this video make much more sense. Okay. So why we wanted to make this next video was to share with you all of the most beautiful things that happened directly after a, you know, not so great event, a pretty shitty event, right? Uh, an event that rocked us and we were not sure. I was certainly not sure if, you know, at that point, if this was going to be a situation that made us go back home that made us return to Canada. You know, like obviously those thoughts, those thoughts crossed my mind. It was actually one of the first things that crossed my mind when I was in my kitchen in the dark by myself and starting to realize what had happened. It was one of the very first thoughts that ran through my mind. Rob's going to make us go home. <laughs> you know, like we're going to have to go home. I think what if we have to go home? What if we have to go back to Canada? Um, you know, we had only been here in Costa Rica for three weeks, so everything was still really new and it, it, I feel like it amplified the feelings of vulnerability because we didn't feel like we had a support group yet. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the upside of things and I'm going to give you a little bit more information on the flip side. Okay, so after this happened, I did what anybody in our day and age would do. I pulled out my cell phone and I started typing a post out on Facebook, right? So there's like a local page for our town, like there is for almost every town like in the world right now. And uh, I posted our story. I outlined it fairly detailed, explained what had happened. And essentially, I think I was doing this because I wanted, I wanted people to know that it happened. I wanted to see if we were alone, like maybe there were other houses that this happened to on the same night. I wanted to get a feel for how common this was uh, in Costa Rica, in our town. I just needed some information. You know, I needed to have some conversations. I could not just sit inside my house in silence and, and feel all these feels alone, you know? And I really didn't want to tell our parents. I didn't want to freak anybody out. We did eventually tell our parents, don't worry, but I really needed to feel like I, I, I needed a good handle on this situation before I did that. So I'm typing my, my, my post on Facebook and um, remember this was like some obnoxious time in the morning, right? So what happens next? I get over 100, well over 100 comments, private Facebook messages, the whole nine yards, people, I'm like having a hard time keeping up. Okay. And these people were all commenting. They were calling, some people were just like, um, condolences, like sympathies. Some people were helping us understand the process, like what we needed to do and where we needed to go. Like the police, where do you go to the police station? Um, we ended up going to the one police station and that wasn't the correct place. And we had to go somewhere else. that was an hour outside of town, for example. And people were really, really kind in giving us their time and explaining to us, you know, this is what you have to do. This is the process that you have to follow, etc. So those kinds of comments. We also had multiple businesses in town message us and say, you know, Hey, bring the kids by for a free ice cream or for this free meal, you know, on us, we know how traumatizing this can be. And you guys are probably feeling all the feels and, you know, come on by. These are people that we've never met before guys. Okay. We've never met any of these businesses in town. We didn't go out for a lot of our meals when we first got here. Uh, we had a ton of fellow Canadians messaging us saying, Oh my gosh, your bank cards are all gone. You can't even take any money out. Uh, like, and you can't eat. So that meant of course, so our bank cards are gone or like credit cards, like everything that's gone. Right? So to put that into perspective for you guys, that meant that we could not go to the ATM to take cash out and we could not go to the store and pay with our debit card. And there's no banks here to get a replacement bank card, which means we essentially had literally no money, no way to buy anything, no way to buy food, no way to pay our rent, no way to do any of that. I declare bankruptcy. So we had multiple Canadian people message us and say, Hey, you know, if you need to e-transfer me some money and I can at least pull it out of the ATM for you, 
you know, um, that's a Canadian thing, I think the e-transfer term, but essentially you send money from my account, which I could luckily in this day and age, we can do that online. Send my money from their, from my account to their account and they could take it out, to the, out of the ATM for us, you know, and they'd be out no money by any means, but that again is somebody offering their time and their services to us. And there was just like such an incredible outpour of kindness and generosity and support. And this is when we really started finding our community here in Costa Rica. And looking back, multiple times I've looked back and wondered if this terrible thing hadn't happened to us when we first got here, would we have created such a beautiful tribe and community of friendships and people, you know, at all or certainly not as quickly you know certainly not as quickly because it really forced us to get out of our comfort zone and we were having to meet people all over the place ask for assistance with this talk to people about this you know like i said going to the police station meeting up with strangers asking them to take money out of the atm for me you know like it, it really all of a sudden i felt like i knew everybody in town everywhere i went people like, were like waving and like oh hi how are you oh gosh were you, the, were you that couple that that happened to and it's Kind of weird as that was, it was actually kind of comforting because all of a sudden we just, there was friendships everywhere. It's actually how I met like my very best friend, my Costa Rica bestie, that's how I met her. She was one of the beautiful people who reached out and offered to take money out of the ATM for us. What? Did we just become best friends? Yup. And it was just a really, it ended up being like this very like upside down beautiful experience on the flip side of things. It was almost like this was the silver lining of this very, very uh, tragic situation. Okay, and so I had no idea how Rob was feeling at this time. We were not doing a very good job at checking in with one another and just being like, how are you right now? Like, how are you feeling? Like, genuinely, how are you feeling? Because remember, for those, fir for those first few days after the event happened, we were really, like I said, you know, we were dealing with all of these people. We were trying to figure out how to get our bank cards like rushed to us from Canada, which can be done by the way. You can use a service like uh, DHL, it's kind of like a FedEx, and you can have things um, mailed to you here, but one single envelope did cost us, you know, $250. So oh, not ideal, but now I know. I, I can tell and I can share with you guys what you can do if you need a, an emergency document in that situation. Because we had heard that the, the mail services here were like really, really uh, hit or miss. And so with a document like this and an emergency like this, we really needed a guarantee. And it was nice to know that although expensive, there was an option, because it did get here. It got here in like 48 hours, we had it. We had our bank cards and, and that was really great. So back to the story there, like I said, we were not doing the greatest job at checking in with each other. We were really just trying to kind of survive. Like I said, Rob was not sleeping at all at night. So he was staying up all night until I woke up 4 a.m. And then I basically took the next shift is what it felt like. Cause then he had to go to sleep and he slept most of the day. And that left me all day with the three kids and kind of trying to work through everything and then of course he'd wake up when he, when he could but it was just it was really daunting so we ended up meeting uh, again through this experience meeting really two lovely human beings who happened to know that in their building there was a unit that was open and ready for immediate occupancy so within that day that we met those people we went and saw that apartment and we gave our notice to our current landlords and like I said uh, in the previous video, we gave them a, a chunk of money because we were feeling really bad to uh, be leaving early, um, even though the circumstances were out of our control. You know, really looking back, this was something that that should have never happened, and uh, it was a really unfortunate situation altogether. But uh, we gave our notice, our very, very fat, like the notice being like, I'm leaving tomorrow. Here is a chunk of money. I'm so sorry that this has happened. I, we have to go. You know, we just wanted everything to feel okay. We just wanted to sleep. And within 24 hours, we moved in to a 24 seven secure, like um, gated with live security. So there were security guards in this building as well. 24 seven, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, building. 
Okay, and it had this building we walked in, and aside from the fact that it was safe, it had the most beautiful view that I have like ever seen. I remember walking in and just be like, wow, like this is just stunning. This is absolutely beautiful. This is nowhere that we would have looked at for ourselves to stay, both because it was a condo, it was an apartment building, right? And we have three kids, so that's not something we were really looking at. But it was kind of neat. Again, this was a piece of what I pulled from this experience as being a silver lining because yes, it was a little bit more expensive per month, but it gave us complete security and it was absolutely stunning. It had a beautiful pool and it was, it was really a great experience. So we moved in there, like I said, like within 24 hours, we packed up all of our stuff. We moved, we settled, we got a good night's sleep and, um, for, you know, for once we got a really good night's sleep. All right, so as we get settled in this new apartment condo living, we're trying to figure out, now we're living on the other side of town, so we're starting to, again, try to figure out how you get to town, uh, the easiest way, do we need the golf cart, do we not need the golf cart? Like, this is all, again, so we're, we're kind of relearning. Even though we're in the same town, we're on the opposite side, so we're relearning, okay? And we're up this giant mountain. We lived up a giant mountain. So uh, we would learn in weeks to come just how difficult it is to carry all of your groceries home every single day when you have a family of five to feed up a giant mountain in the blazing hot Costa Rica sun. Wish I would have videoed that one, that was a good one. Uh, I was super fit, I was not working out at all. It, every day was leg day and it was, it was a golden time. But the, the conversation certainly did kind of ebb and flow through the two of us of, you know, do we feel safe here? Do we safe, feel safe going out? How are we going to feel safe here? Is this where we want to stay for the next couple of months while we were, uh, you know, waiting out the winter? Cause the plan always was at that point to, to go home after three months. And, but we, of course, in that moment, we're like, oh, do we cut the trip short? Should we go, should we go back to Canada, right? And then that conversation kind of came and went as we proceeded over the next couple of months. And it became more and more apparent that we were going to stay. But a lot of the conversation came back to, um, I eventually did post this situation, a very like light version of what had happened on my Facebook because a few people were kind of questioning why I wasn't on social media as much and so on and so forth. And I really felt, I felt like I wanted to share, but I wasn't yet ready to totally share because I was still so kind of confused and shaken and, and didn't really understand. Uh, the whole the wholeness of the situation so i shared a little bit on my facebook and um i had so many people reach out for me from canada reach out to me from canada with their experiences of being robbed uh or jumped or, or any combination of the things that happened to them right there in canada in their hometowns that although it was very hard to hear all of those stories, it was horrible, it's always horrible to hear about this happening no matter where it is, but it did open my eyes and give me a little bit of perspective on the whys, like why these things happen, and on the fact that these things happen quite literally anywhere in the world. Yes, they can be dealt, dealt with differently in different parts of the world. Yes, um, there's different levels and different amounts, 100%. Okay, some places in the world might have more of a history of super violent theft um, or super just violent crime in, in general. And in different parts of the world, the crime might be something different. Like here, I would consider most of the theft to be petty theft. They're looking for your bag left on the beach or, you know, um, expensive electronics, etc. But for the most part, when you take a step back to look at it, it's, it's a petty theft situation. So those, those thoughts, this was all processing and processing and processing for weeks and weeks and weeks. In fact, I remember somebody messaging me, or no, I was on a, I was on a Facebook swap page for my hometown back in Canada uh, that like the week right after everything happened to us and somebody's pickup truck was stolen right from their driveway. And I just remember thinking like, okay, I really need to open my mind and I really need to take it all in before I make any snap judgments or decisions. And that's really, really, really what I strive to do. As much as we felt a little bit of this inside of us, we, I really tried to, um, you know, take time before I made any snap decisions, like I said. 
So here is a thought process that I went through that helped me a lot, okay? And it might, I feel like it'll help anybody out there as well, whether you're looking to make a move somewhere else or not, this was something that I didn't understand, okay? So when we lived back in Canada, we lived in a very like basic neighborhood, nothing fancy about it. We were very like middle to low class with like our, our income. So we had like a modest house, didn't have a whole lot of fancy or flashy or like no really expensive bikes, no really expensive this, that, and the other things. So what you don't understand about that is that you are not a target because you are considered average. But here, when you come here and you're from Canada, you're automatically looked at as having a lot of money or being rich. And this was a really hard concept for us to understand because I've never been looked at like I'm rich. That's not, that's never been a part of my life. So that was very strange for me to think to myself that when other people are looking at me, they're assuming that I have all of this money and they're assuming that it doesn't matter if my camera goes missing because I can just buy another one. And getting used to that, that was something to get used to. That was something that was uncomfortable and I was wondering like, how the hell is this ever gonna go away? Because we were not flashy, other than the fact that we had cameras, we were not super flashy. Like I don't have, I don't wear a ton of jewelry. The jewelry that I wear now is jewelry from here. It's not like, I didn't even wear my wedding ring here. This is my rubber band ring. And that was mostly because I worked out, but also because we were told like flashy jewelry isn't really a thing here. Now, what's kind of neat in that sense is that people don't care as much here about like name brands. Like our kids aren't all like walking around in like Puma and Adidas. Like nobody really cares about that around here, which is kind of nice. Um, but again, it's just like thinking about the differences in perspectives and in where you live and being aware of your surroundings and understanding these things. Okay, because again, if I think about back in Canada, in any of the towns or cities that I ever lived in, if I would talk to somebody who lived in a neighborhood that was maybe considered to be a little bit more affluent than others, those houses had their garages broken into all the time. They had their bikes stolen all the time because people knew that those people had the good bikes. So it, at the end of the day, at the end of the day when we were making the decision and I was making the decision of what felt really good in here and what felt right and true in here to me, it was that it didn't matter. It was not so much, you know, Canada versus Costa Rica. It's where are you and how aware of your surroundings can you be and how can we just be mindful moving forward? How can we make the best choices? How can we understand our environment and make sure that we are doing everything that we can to make it less likely? Because it's never going to be, no matter where I am, even in Canada, I never like walking alone at night. And I didn't like having a ton of flashy stuff because I didn't want people looking at me and, and assuming that I was a target. That was anywhere. That's been anywhere that I've ever been in my life, whether I lived in the city in, in Canada or I lived in a small town because I lived in both and I always had that feeling. So at the end of the day, it was not Costa Rica or Canada. It was just about being smart in my environment. But also knowing that no matter where I am, this is a possibility. So I, all of the things that we don't want to think about are a possibility no matter where we are. So being aware, being um, prepared in any way, shape or form, the best way that you can, this is something that we have to do. And we cannot be afraid to travel. You know, I can't be afraid to go to the next country that maybe we want to visit and fear that the same things are going to happen there. That's not the way that I'm going to choose to live my life and it's not the way that I want my children to live their life. I want them to be prepared and I want them to know the things that are potentially going to happen out there, but we cannot live in that fear. All right, so after all of that, I can tell you that on the daily here, I just, I feel very safe, okay? We're out walking with our children. We live in a lovely neighborhood. Uh, it's, it's really such a beautiful place. There's so many beautiful human beings here and I'm going to say that that's likely true you know, a lot of people talk about um, Nicaragua and Panama and there's going to be good and bad no matter where you go, all right? So my best advice for you is to do as much research as you can, gain friendships and a community wherever you go. Don't be afraid to get out and meet people, go to the restaurant, start talking to people. That's one of the most beautiful things about here is I can make a conversation with just about anybody and everybody's so kind and um, 
smile on face and hi, how are you? Where are you from? How long you been here? Et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. So that is our experience with a very traumatic event and then the aftermath here in Costa Rica. And stay tuned for the next episode because it's going to be a good one.